Welcome to Spruce Grove Alliance Church, your home. Good morning. morning. Thanks for being here this morning. I know you have a lot of choices on a beautiful July day, and uh, it's just a good thing to be together in the house of the Lord. So thank you for being here. I was reading some statistics this week and read that there are over 2.6 billion Christians across the world, and that's almost a third of the world's population. So even though sometimes it feels lonely in our culture to be a Christian, we are a part of something so much bigger than ourselves. And across the world today, yesterday and today, depending on the time zones, People have gathered like we are to worship God, some in secret because it's not safe, some in prison for their faith, some in large groups like this, some in house churches. And so I just think it's just really cool that we can gather together and lift up the name of Jesus across our land. So in summer, we have a lot of choices. And we've called this one stepping out of the noise. You know, Pastor Brent asked us this summer to speak on the clean pages of the Bible. And by that, he said he meant the pages that aren't so well noticed, so well familiar, the pages that we maybe don't have anything written on in the margins of our Bible. And so I picked a verse at the end of Habakkuk chapter 3. And I was really... Um, surprised and pleased to find that last week it was the very same story that Pastor Josh chose to speak about. And he ended at the very verse that I had chosen to speak on today. So I thought, that's pretty cool. I think that the Lord has something that he wants to continue saying to us through the story that Josh told us last week. So just for a little recap... Josh told the story of the prophet Habakkuk, who was living in very hard times. The Israelites were in captivity yet again, and times were very harsh. And Habakkuk went to God and asked, how long is this going to go on? Why all this injustice? Where is the, where is the help? Why are you silent? He asked the questions, he voiced the questions that sometimes we feel too in our lives as we walk along and as we aren't maybe in captivity in another country like they were, but facing struggles and problems of our own, we often ask those questions as well. And so the very last verse in uh, Habakkuk chapter 3, just after Habakkuk's talk with God saying, how long is this going to be? Like, where are you? He says, nevertheless, I will praise you. And so we're going to step out of the noise this morning for a few minutes together and just look at what it does mean to step out of the noise, to say that, nevertheless, I'm going to trust you as Habakkuk did. The Sovereign Lord is my strength. He makes my feet hmm, like the deer. He enables me to tread on the heights. This is the last verse in Habakkuk 3. The Sovereign Lord is my strength. He makes my feet like the feet of a deer. He enables me to tread on the heights. The old King James Version says, the feet of a hind, and a hind I looked up is a red deer that lives in, uh, in the Middle East, and it's very, very swift. And these were the words that Habakkuk said at the end of his lament to God. Even if the fig tree does not blossom, and there is no fruit on the vines, if the yield of olive fails, and the fields produce no food, Even if the flock disappears from the fold and there are no cattle in the stalls, yet I will triumph in the Lord. I will rejoice in the God of my salvation. The sovereign Lord is my strength. 
He makes my feet like the feet of a deer. He enables me to tread on the heights. So Habakkuk had a lot of questions in his life. There were a lot of question marks that he had no answers for. And yet, he said, yet I will, yet I will praise the Lord. I will rejoice in the God of my salvation. And so I thought about what does that look like on a Monday morning when we've got a lot of question marks in our lives? How do we get to the high place? How do we run to the hill like Habakkuk did, like, like he said, I will go like a deer. Uh, the Lord enables me to tread on the heights because the Lord is my strength. So for me, I always have to ask the question, what does this look like on a Monday morning? When we're going out the door and we've come from a, a Sunday of faith and rejoicing with brothers and sisters in Christ, but Monday morning faces us and all the question marks are still there and we've got to get out there and walk with God in a world that isn't always friendly to him. And so what does it look like if we are going to scale the difficult terrain like that deer, like Habakkuk said, I will get to the heights. So, to, so this morning, that's what I wanted to focus on. A little bit of what it looks like to go to the heights. A little bit of what, how, how I do it. And you've got your own stories of how you do it. And we can share together in, as we talk with one another. The deer is able to run with abandonment. to leap securely, and to scale difficult terrain. There's, there's two back there. That's why I was got to look around and look to see if I'm on the right one. The deer runs with abandonment to leap securely and scale the difficult terrain to elude predators and to escape to the heights. He flees to safety. He is sure-footed and confident. And so we ask, what does it look like to be sure-footed and confident in this God who is our strength on a Monday morning when we're walking out there among the question marks. What does this mean on a Monday morning? Where are the high places? What do the high places look like? How do we get there? Okay. One more. There. Hmm. Okay. There's a high place. That's in the high Arctic, by the way. Where are the high places that we can run to? And how do we get there? We have to be very intentional if we're going to step out of the noise. Because isn't there a lot of noise in our world today? There's a lot of noise that constantly, constantly distracts us. The news, Instagram, Facebook, Twitter, all kinds of things. The stuff going on in our own lives. Life is noisy. And so we have to find a place away from the noise. That deer that runs for the secure places escapes what's happening down below and gets to the heights. It's an intentional thing. And I thought it was very interesting this week when the loop came out from Pastor Brent. The last two weeks, the loop, the newsletter that he sends out every Wednesday. If you haven't signed up for it, it's really a worthwhile read each week to keep us informed of what's going on and where he's at. And Pastor Brent talked about how he took some time just recently, to go to Bragg Creek and to walk in the mountains, to take some time, intentional time away, to go and listen to God, to thank Him for what's happened at our church as we grow, and to ask God some questions about what things look like going forward. And so I just thought it was very cool that as we focus on this, out comes our, our pastor's newsletter that tells us that's what he's done. He's modeling this for us. And we, we can be intentional about it as well. Taking our questions to God. When we take our questions to God, 
we can look more into his face and not just at his hand. What are you going to give me, God? Are you going to fix this for me? How soon are you going to do this? Won't you please come through right away? We look to God's hand all the time. And when we take the time to step out of the noise, go to a quiet place, an intentional place, and look at who our God is and worship him, it changes our perspective. The high places in the Bible were the places of worship. And when the Israelites would capture a land, one of the first things they would do would be take down the high places, the places where they went to worship different idols and other gods. They'd take down the high places and they would worship the Lord God. So going to the high places, stepping aside into the quietness, often means going to a place of worship. Not just that place of pleading, please, please, God, I need you to fix this, but that turning from his hand to his face and saying, God, I know who you are, and refreshing ourselves in that. And recalling how God has been in the past in our lives. That's one of the things that Habakkuk did before he came to this nevertheless piece of his prayer, nevertheless I'll trust you. He poured his questions out to God, and then he went back and he recounted all the places the Lord had been. It's in Habakkuk 2. And said, but you were here, Lord, and you were there, Lord, and you were in that situation, Lord. And so sometimes when we go to the quiet places, it's a good thing to just stop and look back and say, yeah, I remember when you drew me to yourself, God. I remember when we take communion, the Lord says, do this to remember me, to remember when he first called us, to remember how he's been there and answered our prayers, to remember how he's strengthened us on the inside, and to remember. Habakkuk remembered. And God had said to Habakkuk, you wouldn't believe me. If, even if I told you what I was going to do, you wouldn't believe me was what God had said to Habakkuk. I'm doing a great thing. And even though it lingers, wait for me. God is at work even when he lingers. He says, wait for me. I'm coming. And you know, it reminds me of the story of Mary and Martha in the scripture. And it's a familiar one. We know it well, where uh, Jesus would often stop in his travels at the house of Mary and Martha and their brother Lazarus. And they knew Jesus well, and they knew that he healed people and he did miracles. And one day when Jesus was away in other parts, Lazarus got sick. And Mary, and Mary sent a message to Jesus. Jesus, come quickly. Lazarus is sick. We need you. Come quickly. Mary was the one, you will remember the story, that would sit at Jesus' feet and listen to what he had to say. Martha was the one that was busy and doing things that needed to be done, both very good things. But Jesus would say to Mar Jesus said in the scripture, one thing Mary's chosen, to sit at my feet and listen to me. So she was taking her time to intentionally be with the Lord. So you can imagine that she was a sensitive soul. She was, she was uh, responding to Jesus in her heart. And when her brother got sick, her faith was full. Jesus will come and heal him. We've seen him do it. He performs miracles. Jesus will come. And then Jesus delayed. And we know the story. Lazarus died. And you know, in the scripture, in the telling of the story... When Jesus finally comes a number of days later, Martha goes out to meet Jesus. Mary stays at home. She's disappointed. She's brokenhearted. Her sensitive spirit that trusted in the Lord and believed with all her heart that he would come and heal her brother hadn't happened. And she stayed at home because her heart was crushed. She was disappointed. Jesus hadn't answered the way she thought he would. But 
when Martha comes out, Scripture says that he says to Martha, go get Mary. Go tell Mary to come. So Mary came. And you know the rest of the story. Jesus went to the grave and said, roll the stone away. And Martha said, no, no, Lord, he's been dead too long. He'll stink. And Jesus said, roll the stone away. And then he called Lazarus forth. And Lazarus was risen to life. So Jesus wanted to show Mary and Martha himself in a brand new way, something they had not yet experienced about him, something they did not yet know about him. And so sometimes when we're in that lingering space, when we feel like it's done, like the disciples must have felt at the foot of the cross, it's done, it's over. God didn't show up for me. He wants to show himself in a new way. There's more of him for us to discover, and he always loves us. And Habakkuk says, yet will I praise him, even though I'm going to still praise him. Because of his faithfulness in the past, I know he'll be faithful in the future. Habakkuk's declaration is one of the strongest declarations of faith in the Bible. And there are others, others of the yet will I praise him. Even Jesus in the Garden of Gethsemane said, I'd like this cup to be taken from me, Lord, but nevertheless, yet, your will be done. I will praise you. So how do we get there? There's two things that I'd like to focus on this morning. What does it look like on that Monday morning when the question marks are swirling and that worship feels distant? God's face feels far away and his hand maybe feels empty. What do we do? Well, we can start with gratitude. Gratitude is always a good place to start. But it's more than finding what we can thank the Lord for today. The sun is shining. We got some rain for the crop, or this has happened, or that has happened. There's things that we can thank the Lord for. And This is tricking me up. What is tricking me up? (laughs) Okay, I don't want that one yet. Okay, so gratitude. We need to we need to find the things to be grateful for. That's a really important point. But gratitude is a progression and it can move to thanksgiving. Thanksgiving, not just for the good things in our hand but thanksgiving for the intangible things, the people in our lives. Thanksgiving for God. Thanksgiving for who God is. And we need to hear each other's stories. We need to hear each other's stories. That's why it's so important to come together. Because when our own story is lingering, as Habakkuk's was, we need to hear the stories of each other's faith and the stories of where God came through when someone else waited. We need those stories. We need to hear those stories. And one of the, one of the stories that has uh, meant a lot to me over the last couple of years is a story that comes from my youngest brother. His wife was diagnosed with cancer a few years ago, and he said to me, we're just going to thank God. I thought, What? Yeah, we're just going to thank God. Because if we know that God is always good, and we say that, God is good all the time, and all the time God is good. If we really believe that God is good all the time, and if we really believe that verse in Romans that says, he works everything out for good to those who love God, he's going to bring good out of this in some way. He said, why wouldn't we thank him? Why wouldn't we thank him? So as they walked through that journey for a few years, I watched them, and they would thank God. And I would say, well, I'm, I'm praying for your appointment this week. And he said, we're thanking God for the results. And I would shake my head. I'd say, well, I'm, I'm still going to pray for the results that 
I think, <laughs> we want. And he'd say, well, we're thanking God because if we believe he's good all the time and that he works things out for our good, we can thank him. And so they walked through that journey, thanking God every step of the way, having thankfulness in their heart. And it was such a testimony to me. And it causes me to stop and think. When I want to pray my best solutions to God, and he says, don't lean on your own understanding. In all your ways, acknowledge him, and he'll direct your path. So when I'm tempted to pray my own solutions and look at my own, the way I want things to go, I stop for a moment and I think, yes, I can thank God for who he is in this. Just like Habakkuk, we don't always know how things are going to turn out. We don't always know what the outcome is going to be. And my goodness, do I want to pray about outcomes. That's often what my prayer requests want to be. The outcome of this, Lord, this is what I want the outcome to be. And we pray for each other, and we give each other our prayer requests. Pray for this outcome. And God says, leave the outcomes to me, and praise me for who I am. Because you are not going to be crushed by what is outside of you, as long as you are filled up on the inside with me. The other thing, the first thing was stories. We need to hear each other's stories. We need to share our testimonies. The person sitting beside you has a story of God's faithfulness in some way. And we need to hear each other's stories. So tell your stories to one another. The second thing is knowing the names of God. That has been such an eye-opening thing for me this last year. Okay. It says, Blessed is the one who trusts in the Lord, whose confidence is in the Lord. And so when we look around at our circumstances and we have all the question marks that don't have answers yet and we can feel them crushing in on us, we can turn our face to God's face and see who he is. So some of you know that uh, my husband's cousin, Pat, ha did um, a tremendous job of spending years pulling out the different names of God out of the Bible. And she made a huge document of all of them. And as I've studied that document over time, it suddenly became clear to me, not, it wasn't sudden, it became clear to me that there was such a link between the names of God, the Father, the names of God, the Son, and the names of God, the Holy Spirit. That three-in-one, that Godhead that we sang about a few minutes ago, that three-in-one, that mystery of the Trinity. And as I began to look at those names, I realized that the Old Testament names of God that we're hearing about so much these days, they point to some of the names of Jesus in the New Testament, and those names of Jesus point to the characteristics of the Holy Spirit that we have to fill us. And so that place right in the middle, God the Son, God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit, we are encased. We are encased in his presence. We are encased in his holiness. We are wrapped there. There are seven, I discovered, seven redemptive names of God, rescuing names of God in the Old Testament. This is one of them, Jehovah Shalom. The Lord is my peace. There are seven I am names of Jesus in the New Testament. I am the vine. You are the branches. And there are at least seven different characteristics of the Holy Spirit. I am a spirit of counsel. And so when we take those things and we blend them together, where God says, the Lord, where the where Jehovah Shalom says, the Lord is my peace. That comes out of the story of Gideon. And Gideon was such an unlikely hero. He was hiding 
threshing grain when, there, when the Israelites were in captivity. And God spoke to him and said, I want you to be a leader, and I want you to lead your people out of this. I want you to lead them into battle, and I will help you have the victory. And Gideon just shrunk back and said, but, but my clan is the least of all the clans, and I'm the least in my clan, so you're talking to the wrong guy here. But as the story goes, and it's a, it's a very good story, the details are fascinating in Judges 6. As it turns out, God kept walking with Gideon, encouraging Gideon, answering Gideon's prayers, and Gideon, in a remarkable victory, led the Israelites to victory. And he built an altar to the Lord to worship him, and he said, the Lord is my peace. I did not do this on my own. I did not get to this victory on my own. The Lord is my peace. And then that points to the New Testament. And Jesus says, I'm the vine. You are the branches. And just as he, just as God flowed through Gideon's story and through his circumstances to bring him to victory, Jesus says, I am the vine. You're the branches. And I am flow through you and through your life to bring you to victory. And then he says the Father, when Jesus went back to heaven, he said the Holy Spirit will come. The Father will send the Holy Spirit to walk with you. And he gives us the spirit of counsel to guide us through the question marks out to the other side, to victory. He fills us up on the inside so that when the question marks are there, they do not crush us. Because we know we have the Lord who is our peace. We have Jesus who flows his life-giving power and strength to us. As Habakkuk said, the Lord God is my strength. And he gives us the spirit of counsel. And there's, there's seven of those that uh, it's just been such a blessing for me to camp on. And you know, my mom has always said that when the Lord has something to say to his children, you'll hear it everywhere. And aren't you hearing about the names of God in a lot of different places? At a devotional or a sermon, you'll hear about the names of God. And I think that the Lord is saying, we need to pay attention to this. Mom would say, you'll hear it everywhere. And so as we, as we look at these things, um, I felt like I needed to maybe write some of what I was learning from Pat's document. And then when Pastor Brent asked us to, to um, discover our verse for the year, to have a vision verse for the year, uh, I picked a vision verse out of Isaiah that said, I will, with joy, I will draw water from the wells of salvation and proclaim the name of my God. And the Lord just popped that verse out to me while we were thinking about that way back in December and January when he said, think about a vision verse that God might have you use for this year to focus on. That popped off the page at me and it was like, with joy you will draw water from the wells of salvation and proclaim the name of the Lord. And I knew, okay, that's my assignment. I need to write about this. I never need to take those seven redemptive names of God and those seven names of Jesus, put them together. And I've completed that now in this first six months of this year, and I tell you, it has been such a blessing. We are encased in the presence of our God, even though the question marks crush in. His names reveal the powerhouse of his character that we can count on. Our confidence doesn't lie in the outcomes. He will hold us firm and steady. Psalm 16:8 <clears throat> says, I have set the Lord always before me. Because he is at my right hand, I will not be shaken. And this is one of the nevertheless, yet will I praise verses that David had in the Psalms that he said, he was pursued by Saul. He went through all kinds of difficult times. He would, the Psalms is full of laments of his to the Lord. Like, where are you? Are you going to rescue me? But he'd always come back 
and this is one of those. I have set the Lord always before me. Because he is at my right hand, I will not be shaken. And boy, it's easy to feel shaken sometimes in this hour on the earth, isn't it? You know, some of the news that we hear, some of the question marks, we can feel shaken. But we have to intentionally set the Lord before us. When we intentionally set the Lord before us, we can run like the deer to those high places to worship him. Not just to beg him for our solutions and outcomes, but to worship him for who he is because he has us encased in his presence and in his holiness because he loves us. He settles our hearts in that strength of his. So when the, when the world pushes in and the things that keep us awake at night crowd into our day and we intentionally take that time to say, I'm going to go to a place of worship. I'm going to go for a walk. I'm going to go for a run. I'm going to sit in the backyard on my deck and have some quiet time. Sometimes, if we just take 15 minutes and listen to two or three worship songs in a row and just let them wash over our souls, the words of those can become like prayers. And it just washes the dust off our souls. Worship takes us out of that place of franticness up to the heights to escape the perils. Okay. Oops. There. This is a favorite verse of mine from Jeremiah 17. Blessed is the one who trusts in the Lord, whose confidence is in him. That verse we already quoted underneath the Trinity. It goes on to say, that one the one who trusts in the Lord and puts their confidence in the Lord, he will be like a tree planted by the water that sends its roots out by the stream. It doesn't fear when heat comes. The leaves are always green. It has no worries in a year of drought and never fails to bear fruit. So we can ask, where's our confidence? And when we find the things that we've put our confidence in shaking, we know that we have an unshakable place to put our confidence. It matters where we look. It matters that we get to the heights. Our oldest son was flying across the country last week, and uh, as they flew into BC, this was the exact picture out his windshield of the plane. And he grabbed his iPhone and took a picture and sent it to John and I and said, look at, look at the layers of smoke and look at the, vis the visibility in the middle. I just thought it was such an incredible picture. Just, it, it matters where we focus. The smoke was billowing up from down below. It was other parts of smoke from Saskatchewan were inverting and coming in. But yet, there was this light. It matters where we focus. Scripture tells us that God has rescued us from the dominion of darkness. And he's transferred us to the kingdom of his beloved son, to the kingdom of light. And he says, above all else, guard your heart, for it's the wellspring of all of life. Guard your heart. It's the wellspring of life. And you know, a lot of stuff bombards our heart. And one of the ways we guard our heart is by getting to the heights, getting intentionally getting to that place of worship, to guard our heart, because so much tries to come in from the distractions. And you know, this guarding our heart, there's a cyclical effect. God also says in Philippians, that if we give him our problems, his peace will guard our hearts and minds through Christ Jesus. It's a cyclical effect. He tells us, guard your heart. And then he says, 
when you give everything to me, I will guard your heart and mind in Christ Jesus. It's a beautiful picture. And this, if you've heard me speak before, you've probably seen this because I just love this rule of 60 that my husband told me about years ago and in the flying in the aviation environment. It's called the one in 60 rule. Each degree off your heading over a distance of 60 miles will result in one mile off course. So if your compass is one, your heading is one degree off, one degree, not much, and you go 60 miles, you'll be a mile off course. You go 120 miles, you'll be two miles off course, and it just keeps going. One degree. That's why we have to guard our hearts. Have our faith in the Lord, because, boy, that one degree is so easy to get off course. The sovereign Lord is my strength. He makes my feet like the feet of a deer. He enables me to tread on the heights. The sovereign Lord is my strength. The sovereign Lord, he is ultimately over everything. Our other son is also a pilot, and he took this picture on a dark night last winter, flying through the darkness of the sky, and all of a sudden it lights up. All of a sudden it lights up. Joy can spring forth unexpectedly out of the darkness. We need each other's stories, tell each other's stories, plant our feet firmly in the faith of who our God is, in spite of what it looks like around us, like Habakkuk said. Intentionally get to the places of worship. And we are encased in his presence and in his holiness. And if you've ever been baptized, you know that they say, I baptize you now in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. You are wrapped, encased in that holy place. It is a firm place to stand. And the verse that I want to leave with you today is this. May the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace as you trust in him so that you may overflow with hope by the power of the Holy Spirit. All of that verse, that whole verse, is what God's going to do except those five little words in the middle, they're our part, as you trust in Him. Thanks for listening to this week's message from Spruce Grove Alliance Church. For more information or to hear past messages, please visit sgac.net.